Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for we've got a couple of more minutes to wait for colleagues to join, and then we'll kick off this webinar. Okay, so we'll just come back and we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Well, welcome to this University of Glasgow Business of Sustainability webinar. My name is Graham Roy and I'm Dean of External Engagement at the University of Glasgow's College of Social Sciences. And it's my pleasure to host this conversation today. This is the third in a series of forums we're hosting in the run-up to COP26. And over the course of this series, we're hearing from a range of speakers about how businesses are responding to the global climate crisis. We're delighted that joining us today are Gabrielle Guineer and Ian Cavaney from BT. As you know, BT is one of our largest companies, so we're de delighted and looking forward to hearing about their sustainability journey and the challenges and opportunities that this organisation sees from climate change. Gabrielle has led BT's environmental sustainability programme since 2009. She's responsible for BT's climate and environmental strategies and represents BT in various external um, environmental and sustainability forums. We'll then hear from Ian, and Ian leads BT's strategy for developing breakthrough tech that can help in the fight against the climate crisis and provide support to vulnerable people. The format there'll be, we'll be here from our speakers for about 25, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for um, conversations and, and, and Q&A, and we'll do our best to finish um, as sharp as possible at five o'clock, ideally beforehand, as I know it's been a long day and there's lots of COP activities on, on the go. So I'm delighted if I could um, introduce Gabrielle to um, kick off this webinar and to share your reflections and thoughts on, on BT's sustainability journey. Thank you, Gabrielle. Okay, um, thank you, Graham. And uh, thank you everybody who's here. Um, it, it's great to talk to you today. Um, and I'm actually coming up to, to Glasgow from uh, London on, on Sunday for COP26. So I hope you're gonna put the, the good weather on for me. No rain, please. Right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna talk through BT's, um, as Graham mentioned, BT's climate action journey and what we've uh, been doing. So if we go to my uh, second slide. Next slide, please. So if we look at BT's climate strategy, our priorities fall into five different areas. Um, firstly, becoming net zero in our operations and supply chain. Secondly, helping customers to reduce their carbon footprint. And we do that through our products and services. So for example, the service that we're using today, uh, but also through services like um, vehicle telematics, for example, that help drivers uh, find faster routes or help uh, people find uh, parking spots more easily so they don't have to drive around as much. And actually, these solutions are 25% of BT's revenues at a value of over £5 billion. Uh, reporting and transparency. It's always been very important to BT to be completely transparent around how we're doing in terms of reducing our carbon emissions and also in terms of our challenges going forward. Leading the public debate and inspiring others. So, you know, just being out there talking to people uh, about BT's climate action journey, leading by example, and hoping that others will, will join us. And finally, around closing the loop and promoting a circular economy. So if we go to the next slide. So taking action on climate is actually not something that's new for BT. It's something that we've been doing for almost 30 years now. We set our first carbon reduction target in 1992, and that was really before people were thinking about carbon reduction. We set our first science-based target in, in 2008, and that was to cut the carbon emissions intensity of our business by 80% by 2020. 
We met that uh, target four years ahead of time in 2016, and that was primarily driven through our purchasing of renewable energy. So um, 2016, we thought, okay, we've met this target. We want to be even more ambitious. So we announced a new science-based target, which was aligned to 1.5 degree pathway, which is the most ambitious aim of the Paris Agreement. When we announced that target, uh, BT was the third company in the world to do so. So, you know, there were three companies and I'm delighted that now we have thousands of, of companies that have set these types of targets because that's really where we need to end up. Um, and at the time, we pledged to be a net zero emissions business by 2045. We've actually just um, updated our targets and our new targets are to be net zero for our own operations by 2030 and for our supply chain and customer emissions by 2040. And setting these targets have been really important for BT as a business for two reasons. Um, firstly, because it has galvanized the business in terms of you know, putting effort towards meeting those targets. So if we go out and say publicly, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, the business starts thinking about, well, how are we actually going to meet this target and what do we need to do? And secondly, because it has set a, a signal to the market. So when we said in, in you know, 2008, well, we have this target um, and it's going to be reliant on, on renewable um, electricity, which we now use 100% of worldwide, it set a signal to the market. So when a big company like BT sets these types of targets, you know, that that's a demand signal. And then the suppliers know that that companies like BT are are looking for these types of resources. If we go to the next slide, please. So yeah, so how are we actually gonna get to net zero? So as I mentioned, switching to renewables, um, which we've done 100% of our electricity worldwide is from renewable sources. That is something that we need to, to keep on doing. Um, decarbonizing our state and looking at how we can heat our buildings uh, without using gas, for example. Uh, but our biggest challenge is around transitioning our fleet. So BT and Openreach have the UK's second largest fleet after Royal Mail. We have around 33,000 vehicles and we need to transition all of those um, to electric or, or low carbon. And the challenge that we're facing there is that although you know, there are passenger cars, more and more passenger cars that are EVs. The type of vehicles that we are looking for, which are the heavy goods vehicles and, you know, specialist vehicles and cranes and things, they actually don't exist at the moment as, as low emissions vehicles. So um, what we decided to do was to join forces with an organization called the Climate Group to set up something that we call the UK Electric Fleets Coalition. And that's what I meant about, you know, leading the debate. So we said, okay, well, we are facing this issue um, in, in decarbonizing and we need uh, policy makers to change uh, investment, for example. We need price parity for vehicles. We need that whole national infrastructure of electric vehicle point uh, vehicle charge points, which we don't have because we have a national fleet. Um, we need more vehicles. There just isn't enough supply at the moment. So um, we now have over 30 companies that are part of the UK Electric Fleets Coalition, um, and they include five of the six biggest fleet operators in the UK. And that's how we kind of look at these challenges. You know, how, how can we change policy? That's really by coming together, collaborating with others and, and creating this bigger kind of movement with other companies. And I think, um, you know, we were quite instrumental in getting the change to ban uh, petrol and diesel vehicles um, in the sale of them from 2030 in the UK. And we're continuing to advocate for the things that, that we need so we can get to decarbonized um, transport. Um, but this is also about, you know, energy savings for us and cost savings for us as a business. Um, so we've saved 358 million pounds through our energy efficiency programs. And we're doing quite well in terms of, of um, meeting our targets and getting to, to net zero. 
If we go to the next slide, please. So when we look at BT's end-to-end -end carbon emissions, actually only 5% of those are from our own operations. 24% come from customer use, customers using our products. So that's when customers are using their broadband router or you know, their EE phone or large um, companies like Nestle, for example, you know, they have BT network infrastructure around the world. But 71% is from our upstream supply chain, um, and which is you know, in no way unusual. A lot of companies will see their biggest carbon impact coming from their suppliers. So this is an area we've spent quite a bit of time focusing on. Um, so for example, some of the things that we're looking to do is build a climate clause into key contracts. So when we are negotiating for a big new contract, we say, actually, by the way, um, if you want this contract with BT, um, you need to sign up to, you're required to reduce um, your carbon emissions over the term of the contract with BT. And that's quite powerful because it moves the conversation away from just sustainability people talking to sustainability people uh, to actually becoming uh, an executive and contractual um, discussion. Um, we've had our chief procurement officer send out an email to all of our suppliers asking them to switch to 100% renewable electricity, to set net zero targets and to engage with their suppliers. And, and that was kind of a, a survey that people had to fill in with three simple questions. Um, but if they said no to uh, renewables and they said no to setting a net zero target, we actually followed up. Uh, with the number of them in terms of phone calls. And I'm pleased to say that just since we sent that letter out in December of last year to we talked to people in the summer, a lot of them have joined us on this net zero journey. Using our purchasing power, you know, BT is a big company and uh, we can influence our suppliers through our purchasing power. So 15% of our education criteria is now linked to environmental and human rights uh, performance. We ask our suppliers to disclose to something called, we used to call it the Carbon Disclosure Project and now CDP, which is basically um, a depository uh, for uh, companies to, to disclose their carbon and climate activities. And we found that just by getting people to, to think about climate and to think about carbon, that actually drives action. Um, and we're also looking at how can we drive sustainability innovation amongst our suppliers. So we run something called the BT Game Changing Challenge, uh, which is a bit like BT's Dragon's Den. We ask suppliers to come in and pitch new innovative ideas. So for example, we last year we focused around plastics and, and circular economy. And then, you know, we, we declare a winner and we work with that company to take that um, idea forward. Go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, you know, advocating for change uh, is something that's key to us. I think, you know, being able to use the influence and the power and the brand that we have to inspire others. So we are part of a number of, of different initiatives just to, to spread the whole kind of message around climate action and how how important it is that um, that companies do get involved. And so in terms of a specific example, um, if we go to the next slide, please. So uh, we joined uh, forces uh, with an initiative, an NGO called the Exp Exponential Roadmap Initiative, but also four other companies, Ericsson, Ikea, Telia, and Unilever, as founding partners to, to set up this, what we call 1.5 supply chain leaders. We wanted to, again, drive, work together to drive climate action throughout global supply chains. And as you will see, we've been joined since by some, some very big brands. And it's really, you know, getting more and more companies like these big brands to go out to suppliers, to go out to other companies and say, basically, we would like you to set a 1.5 degree aligned science-based science -based targets. And to help companies to get on this journey, if we go to the next slide, um, we've launched something called the SME Climate Hub. 
this is really a, you know, a depository of different tools and materials and uh, talking about, you know, what is net zero? How does it work? How do I measure my carbon footprint? And it also asks uh, companies to, to commit to a net zero target. And this is specifically targeted to, to smaller businesses because as you can imagine, so, you know, the brands you saw previously, um, we have tens of thousands of, of suppliers. So of course, while we can engage with our bigger suppliers on things like the contract clause, um, we cannot go and, and engage on you know, a one-to-one -one basis with, with SMEs. So we're hoping that this uh, will provide that kind of help for them to, 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 to set a net zero target. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, we've also been working uh, with the UK government and I actually did um, a presentation to a Scottish uh, audience, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, again, they have been doing, the UK government has been doing these kind of regional type uh, virtual um, road shows um, to talk to smaller businesses across the UK to get them engaged in the run up to, to COP around net zero. And so this is a dedicated um, UK specific website, but it also links to the SME Climate Hub. It's just a different kind of, of, of front end. And we ran a competition called Heroes of Net Zero, and we will be awarding them um, in Glasgow um, at the COP on, um, on the 2nd of November. So it's been great to see. We've got about 2,000 um, small businesses across the UK that have signed up um, through this campaign to the, to the SME climate commitment, which basically means that they have agreed to, to they've committed to set a um, net zero target by, by 2050, a net zero by 2050 target. Um, they have said that they will half their, um, their emissions by 2030, and they've said that they will report annually on, on which progress they're making. So that was really a very quick whistle stop tour around BT and, and what we've been doing for the past 30 years, not quite, um, and, and specifically what we've been focusing on this year, which is really to, to drive companies' commitment to net zero in, in the run-up to, to COP. I'm now going to hand over to Ian, who is going to talk about innovation and BT's Green Tech Innovation Platform. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Gabrielle. Okay, if we just jump to my first slide. Great. Yeah, so as Gabrielle sort of highlighted at the start, one of the key things that, that we believe is, is achievable is, is that our products and services can play a major role in helping people to reduce their own carbon footprint. So the examples of telematics or, for example, using things like Zoom, like we've already mentioned, are, are good examples of that. But we believe there's other ways and, and new areas that, that our products and services can, can actually help customers. And that's what has driven our work with the Green Tech Innovation Platform. So. In the, in the next few slides, I hope to give you some examples of what that work entails and uh, yeah, hopefully inspire you to think about how, how that tech can help. So if we go to the next slide. So one of the critical things is that whilst technology does produce its own emissions and obviously that is part of what um, is, is important that we do continue to drive our own emissions down and to work within our supply chain, there's no doubt equally that uh, technology is going to play a really critical role in helping the world to uh, transition to a net zero world. And from a BT perspective, there's different ways we look at this, but, but fundamentally, if you think about it uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, we think about what we're investing in, in terms of the infrastructure we have here in the UK. So our rolling out of uh, fibre to the premises across the UK, so a £15 billion investment there that where we're looking to pass over 20 million homes by 2025, as well as our ongoing investment in 4 and 5G coverage across the UK. That, that, those, that network infrastructure is basically creating a, a digital backbone which can act as an enabler for, for new technologies and new products and services to, to actually help customers with their transition to uh, net zero. And this is borne out by some studies that are out there. And for example, the 20% the factor there is, is that from a study by Jesse, um, a Smarter 2030 report that looks to see that essentially ICT services have the opportunity to help reduce net zero carbon emissions by 20% by 2030. So that is a huge role that we can play. But the important thing is that 
and, and this is where BT is very much at the forefront here, is it's really about demonstrating impact. A lot of this is often about the potential, but what are we actually doing on the ground? So if we go to the next slide, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, we'll have a short video to give you an example of uh, how 5G is powering uh, some work in the Fourth Valley. In the global effort to fight climate change, Scotland has committed to becoming a net zero society by 2045, achieving a balance between the amount of greenhouse gases put into and removed from the atmosphere. These are the most ambitious targets of any country in the world. We're working with the University of Stirling to build their state-of-the-art environmental monitoring system designed to help support their digital-led green recovery program. Known as Fourth Era, using IoT sensors satellite data and artificial intelligence, the program will provide vital information on water quality and quantity to inform decisions that could provide major economic regeneration and sustainability benefits to the region. Fourth Era sets a new global standard for green recovery, one that can be easily scaled and replicated throughout Scotland, the UK and the rest of the world for years to come, leading the way to a more sustainable future. The monitoring system that's been developed gives researchers in Scotland a living laboratory, providing real-time access to environmental data and analytics for the region, facilitating world-leading scientific research, promoting further improvements in environmental management. It's the first of its kind, helping businesses in the region make intelligent, data-driven decisions to adopt more sustainable practices. And it's all made possible through our connectivity solutions, which includes EE's number one 5G network. Working with regional stakeholders, this groundbreaking project can help reduce the effects of flooding in the region, an issue which affects local businesses and communities. Using artificial intelligence and machine learning, the Living Laboratory will monitor the impacts of floods and improve flood risk forecasting and alerts. Protecting homes and businesses in the region, building resilience in local communities. It will also help to attract new business and tourism building the case for longer-term investment in the area. The technology being developed in fourth era can be applied across multiple sectors, from agriculture and fisheries, and food and drink, to shipping and navigation, local and national governance, and public health. Water bodies in Scotland and across the UK can be affected by harmful algae blooms in the summer, and climate change is making things worse. But by using 5G-enabled technology to track these algae blooms and send alerts, the platform will be able to help keep the region's drinking water safe, allowing us to react to changes in the environment and spot signs early, turning a once manual process into an automated one using real-time data. Bringing science, regulation and business together, Fourth Era will demonstrate a better, more sustainable way to interact with and look after the world around us. We'll be able to understand how the environment is changing, predict future patterns, and identify potential climate-related risks before they become long-term threats. By continuing to innovate, collaborate, and realize the possibilities that new technologies can bring, we aim to inspire global action, making a net zero future a reality. Great. So hopefully that that video has given you a, an idea of, of things that are actually happening on the ground already. And I think it, it, it is just a, what, one example of the type of work we're looking to do. Um, the next bit of work I want to talk about is actually the, the Green Tech Innovation Platform. Um, so the Green Tech Innovation Platform, or we, as BT, we love for a, a shortened abbreviation, so we call it the Green Tip for short. Um, this has the objective of helping us to uncover breakthrough tech and partnerships which we can use as a business to support our customers on their net zero journey. Um, this project was launched in June 2020 by Philip Janssen, our CEO, and, and is fully aligned to what um, business overall in, in, in the strategy for BT overall and, and how we are going to be embedding these products and services moving forward. And how we essentially run this program, we, we're running it as this open innovation 
program in association with an organization called Plug and Play. So Plug and Play are a Silicon Valley based organization. Essentially what they do on one side of their business is they do a lot of scouting and research into startups and scale up businesses across the globe. But on the other side of the business, they, they work with major corporate customers like BT to help uh, match them to those uh, startups. So with Plug and Play, we create a brief where we look to uh, solve a specific challenge or look to actually create a new opportunity. And through plug and play scouting across the world, we then get a list of companies who we could potentially work with. And then through that process, we'll then uh, run a number of pitches and, and meetings and ideally get to a point where we choose a specific partner and take that partner to forward for a what we call a proof of concept, which is where we essentially look to trial that solution. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that in a second as to exactly how that works as well, because it, it, it's quite an interesting process. And in the first year of running Green Tip, um, we've worked with our enterprise division, which is our business to business part of BT, and we announced our new partnerships on the 26th of January this year. So if we jump to the next slide, as I mentioned, what this is about, and the way to think about this innovation process is, 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 is a bit of a journey basically whereby at an early stage we look to as I mentioned find a specific problem to solve or an opportunity to find. We'll then work with plug and play to uh, look at what is available in the market. Through that process we'll choose a partner to work with. Then we'll look to uh, partner and, and develop a business relationship with that partner and, and develop what we call a proof of concept which is where we essentially will look to trial that solution with a customer to prove that it works. And on the successful completion of a proof of concept, we'll then look to uh, see how we can scale that opportunity in that business across the whole of, of the UK through our enterprise business unit. So as you can see, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process to embed the organization and the new partner into our business, and then hopefully to grow the business from there. So if we jump to the next slide, as I mentioned, what's really important is, is that you choose an area to focus on. And with the first uh, green tech innovation platform, we chose to focus our innovations for our public sector customers. So these are organizations like local councils um, across the UK. And we developed three different briefs of activity that we wanted to focus on. The first one was looking at how we can uh, implement air quality sensors into what are called our street hub units, They're essentially the, the pay phones of the 21st century, um, and use those air quality insights to help drive climate action. The second area was called smart buildings. So here we're essentially looking at uh, Internet of Things or IoT capable solutions that will help our public sector customers to uh, help reduce preventative maintenance costs and to deliver climate benefits. And the third area we were looking at was uh, what we call remote diagnostics. So this was looking at products and solutions that will help reduce travel. So for example, enabling remote repairs or enabling uh, remote diagnostics by health or other public sector workers. So against those th three specific briefs, we then look to find different partners. And if we go to the next slide. Um, what we found, and this is an example of what, what we call a deal flow process to find, to find those customers. So if we take, for example, the smart buildings work stream. So, we had that brief scouting process. In the first list of companies, we had over 76 SMEs that, that we felt that could actually potentially meet our needs. But then with the business partners in the, uh, and the technical teams at BT, we then went through a process of reducing that number by ensuring that some, you know, who had the best capabilities, who had the right best technology, right through to a process where we had um, three SMEs that came to us and actually did a pitch and, and we did some brainstorming with them. But out of that process, we ended up working uh, with a Glasgow-based scale-up called IOPT. And I'll go on to explain a little bit about what they do in a second. And followed a very similar approach with um, the Smart Streets work, where essentially we gained sort of a long list of companies, went for the pitch processes, and then we've ended up working with a French uh, startup called Ever Impact. Um, what was quite interesting as well through this process as well as worth noting is that whilst we had the remote diagnostics area, what we did realize was actually through working with different parts of business, we actually found that there was some existing work we were doing um, with uh, University Hospitals Birmingham, which is a perfect example of the work here. So we actually decided not to, to actually run the innovation work uh, by finding a new partner because essentially we were already in a good position to deliver solutions in that space. 
And if we jump to the next slide, I'll jump to what those are. Yeah, so first off with smart streets, um, what do we have there with Ever Impact? So essentially what Ever Impact is able to do is that we are able to combine both air quality and CO2 monitoring into our street hub units, along with using satellite data. So what this does is it enables cities and local authorities to measure the impact of climate action. So for example, when they implement a traffic calming system, they can actually see what the CO2 impact is and the air quality impact is of that solution over time. And what's really strong here is that essentially what, what our solution here enables is that a, a local council or city authority can monitor, report and verify their climate actions. And then even potentially through that process, actually look to create sales of carbon offsets through that work. So again, a, a very super innovative solution there. Um, with its IOPT, uh, the Glasgow-based st startup, so what they have is a, a brilliant IoT platform um, and it essentially enables uh, local councils or housing associations to have real-time information and alerts on the status of their properties so they can detect things like damp, mould, etc. And they can also underlie, uh, detect underlying issues such as fuel poverty in their tenants. So what this does, it enables massive, huge improved asset protection and improved duty of care for tenants because what it does is that it enables preventative maintenance costs to be reduced massively because you can actually spot problems before they happen and, and remedy them before that they become very expensive. And then finally, it also means that um, you're not having to travel to properties you don't need to travel to, so therefore reducing lots of travel and, and therefore helping the environment as well. And then finally, with the remote diagnostics work, um, as I mentioned, we started working with the University Hospitals Birmingham. And whilst this work was started before COVID um, hit, it certainly has been accelerated by it. But, but what this is enables is that doctors and other healthcare providers, they can actually collaborate remotely themselves. Um, so, so again, reducing the need for them to travel and meet in person. And then secondly, it will also enable them to remotely consult with and support their patients. So obviously there's massive savers on travel, but, but also what they found in the sense of the impact and, and the services they deliver here, that there has been, you know, there's been no uh, reduction in the quality of service care as well, which is obviously highly important. If we jump to the next slide, please. And also, one of the other things that we're doing, as Gabrielle's mentioned, is, is that we do use our power and support of BT to, to help drive and, and innovation and collaboration on, on a wide scale. And that's one of the examples that we've worked with the SCDI and other partners, such as the Royal Society of Edinburgh and Scotland is, to create what is called Innovation Critical. Um, so this is essentially a report looking at the net zero emission and the climate tech opportunity that, that is there for Scotland and basically highlights the fact that Scotland itself has a potential to be a leading innovator and exporter of tech solutions to support climate change. Um, I mean, and, and obviously the Fourth Valley era is, is one such example as that. But what the report does is, is delve into lots of different challenge areas for Scotland as a country to address, but also goes on to propose recommendations as to how Scotland can grow its climate tech sector and, and deliver a transition to net zero. So one of the key things is very much about how this can support and create green jobs, boost exports, and, and basically create a, a bigger culture of innovation and productivity within the country. And what it does is, as I mentioned, has got some clear recommendations around how you can set a clear vision to set ahead of COP, support that early stage innovation. And that's not only for the investment in these startup companies, but also by addressing the skills required to, to support that innovation. But I do recommend that, that you do check out this report because there's lots of um, useful information in there. And again, hopefully sort of thing we'll hear a lot more talk about coming up in COP26 very soon. So if we just jump to the next slide. So hopefully through both my presentation and, and Gabrielle's, you've seen that we, we have this opportunity as an organization to help create a fair and more resilient low carbon society. So that's not only through how we reduce our own carbon impact as a business, but how we also are there to help our customers on that net zero transition as well. But what we also hopefully highlighted is the fact that it does require a lot of collaboration both with government, business and society. So there's not one organization on its own that's gonna make a difference. It is really about how we work collectively uh, across society to make this impact. And finally, the point there is to say that, you know, as an organization, we're fully committed to help that transition and help reboot the UK's economy through that work as well. So that's the end of our presentation now. Um, so we'd welcome some questions and, and uh, I'll hand back to Graham.
Great. Um, thank you very much, Ian. And thanks, Gabrielle, as well, for these um, great presentations. So a couple of questions, um, if that's OK, if I could um, just explore with you. So um, you talked really elo eloquently there about all the different aspects that you've got going on in the various in in interactions you've got with customers and, and government and, and, and the behaviour you're doing yourself. You mentioned just picked up the point that you mentioned there at the end, Ian, about collaboration, about it being business, consumers, and, and government. How how can how in a world where you're fiercely competitive with your other businesses, your rivals, and potential um, uh, people who might be wanting to take your market share, how how can an industry come together in a collaborative way around something like climate change and any reflections that you've got? It might be of value for other industries who are maybe not at that same level of progress that you, you've got to. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. I mean, I think that the starting point is that as when it comes to something as important as climate change, it, it affects all our businesses. So you know, the, the fact that we all need to do something about it is massively important. And there's certain aspects where. If you take, for example, the Green Tech Innovation Platform, you know, obviously part of that work there is actually to drive our own competitive advantage and to actually to develop products and services that support our customers. Um, and in some ways, if that inspires our competition to do similar things, then actually that's great because hopefully what we're all going to be doing is, is heading in, in a similar direction to um, helping our customers to reduce their carbon footprints. But there are also lots of other examples where, you know, we, we kind of do collaborate and work together. So, for example, um, at a European level, uh, there's the European Green Digital Coalition, which is an example of lots of different telecoms companies coming together to actually work collaboratively to address issues around climate change. And for example, in um, coming up in Scotland as well, we're also part of a an exhibition which is being run by uh, DEFRA, the Department for uh, Environment, Food, Rural Affairs. And we are there with Vodafone, we're there with other competitors presenting our climate tech solutions and just highlighting, you know, that that collaboratively we've all got a part to play. And, you know, things like if you think about uh, elements such as uh, in the future, looking at the circularity of the mobile phone business, you know, there's probably examples where, you know, both ourselves and Vodafone and other players in this marketplace do need to think about, well, how are we going to change the business models that we currently operate to, to, to help drive that? So there is an element of, of, you know, having those open and honest discussions between us. And, and we have lots of those opportunities on, on quite a regular basis to, to meet, meet, meet our partners on that. Uh, but there is this also a, a kind of, a, say, a kind of a, a healthy level of competition for us to all spur each other in, in driving those activities. So it, it really is that kind of... <laughs> You know, there's obviously a point between where there's the commercial sensitivities, but at the same time, you know, there's going to be times where we do need to join forces to address issues. And and, and I would just add to, to Ian's point, you know, that there are lots of issues that we are all grappling with around carbon footprinting methodologies, for example. So whereas, you know, BT and, and Sky might be competing, we will be sharing information about, well, how did you do this carbon footprinting or, or with Vodafone and how are you doing this? Because, yes, it's, it's a very, I'd say... Um, you know, having been in this role for um, 12 years, it's a very supportive community when you get into sustainability. You know, we're all fighting for the same thing. You know, we're all trying to figure out the same types of problems. So everybody's really open uh, about sharing various issues and, and solutions that they've found. And, and that makes us all better because we can learn from each other and we move forward together. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting you say that because we had... In an early edition of this series, we had someone from the Scotch Whiskey Association, and they were saying pretty much the same thing in a completely different industry, but actually how they're fiercely competitive in in the product, and the product is quite diff difficult to differentiate on certain occasions. But actually, on issues like this, the coming together was actually something which was hugely supportive of the industry, which was then a calling card for the entire industry to go out and reach out to the world for markets. So it was really interesting to hear that that kind of same story coming through on an issue around sustainability. And can I just maybe ask, Gabrielle, just one thing when you're talking about the business model and things, um, how much work do you do to then think about the supply chain and the sustainability of the supply chains that you draw on? I mean, you touched on a lot of the different things that you're doing and the companies that you, you work with, but how much would you, for example, take a strong view about the sustainability behaviours of, of someone with, you know, further along your supply chain? Yeah, so, so I, I, I think, you know, we are not quite 
there yet where we're going to say, okay, if, if you don't have a net zero target, we're not going to do business with you. But I think we are starting to get to that point. So what we've done so far is, you know, um, as, as I mentioned, you know, the phone calls that we made, you know, we're really trying to help. We're trying to work with our suppliers to understand, well, what are the barriers to you? How, how can we help you? How can we build you up? We've done a lot of, um, you know, over the past 10 years, a lot of education, education, upskilling of our suppliers to get to a level where we wanted them to be on, on sustainability. And and to be honest, you know, so we developed the, this assessment model for suppliers uh, in 10 different areas. So that looked at eco design, it looked at carbon footprinting, it looked at how they work with their suppliers, um, it, it looked at um, CSR in, in general. So we, we rated them um, bronze, silver and gold. And, you know, when we started, um, everybody was at bronze level. You know, this is key suppliers. And, 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 you know, this is not something that they were talking about. So we decided, well, you know, we need them, we need to move them up. So we are going to be training them on, on sustainability and we want them to, to get to a much higher, higher level. So I think that's what we've been trying to do. But I think things are changing. I think you're going to see that, um, you know, if, if companies don't have a net zero target, it's becoming a hygiene factor. If you don't, you're kind of out, um, you know, you're going to be seen as, a, as an outlier um, very soon. Okay, that's really helpful. And there's a question about HR practices and the role that they potentially play in terms of um, helping sustain um, uh, certain sustainability targets. Maybe we can maybe unpick that. So one is, it'd be really interesting to get your reflections on, on what your employees are saying around uh, sustainability and how that feeds through to what you're doing as an organisation. Um, but then also how you may then be feeding back into them about behaviours and home working and, and um, uh, actions that individuals might take around climate change. So if I could maybe ask you on both avenues, so one from how much are they demanding of you and then equally how much are you demanding of them about their, about, um, their sustainability behaviours? So if, if I can just start on, on, on that one. So um, last year, we introduced a new bonus criteria for eligible uh, managers within BT. So 10% of people's bonuses is now linked to BT's carbon reduction performance and how we're doing on, on, on digital skills. So I think that actually made a big difference to people in, 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 in their jobs because they went, oh, Actually, I'm now being, you know, rewarded on how BT as a business is is doing in this in this space. So I'm just going to say that. And so, in terms of our employees, you know, we are seeing, I think, in in when we're trying to recruit people these days, uh, obviously sustainability is becoming a much higher criteria. People want to work for somebody that they believe is, you know, is good at, at climate action, is taking this 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 seriously. Um, and as I said, you know, I've been in this role for a while and, you know, in the beginning there was, you know, no employees would ask me about anything. You know, it was like, you know, I could sit here at BT Centre and no, no employees would care about anything that I did. And you know, now we have something, we have a colleague board, which is, it's made up of, of colleagues from around the business and, you know, key highlight, you know, on their agenda, they only want to do, what are we doing on sustainability? We're not doing enough. We need to do more. So there's lots and lots of input from employees who are really, really interested in what we do in this space and, and want to help, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a bit from me. Ian, I don't know what you want to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you covered the key points. I think one thing as well that, that's really interesting, as Gabrielle said, is the fact that, you know, now when we speak to colleagues, nobody's questioning that climate uh, and sustainability isn't important. You know, that there's actually more and more cases now of where it's actually impacting their jobs. So if you think about so all of our customers who, who work in our, again, creating uh, bids with our customers. The, the sustainability element of, of what BT can do is, is a massive part of a lot of the bids that we now now run for our customers. So as we have put in tough asks within our own supply chain, our, our customers are doing the same. So obviously th th there's a lot of customer pull for, for sustainability activities, which is, is obviously then impacting uh, the, the organization as well. And I think the other element that HR can do is and play a critical role as well is the fact that um, you know, 
myself, Gabriel, and a couple of colleagues are essentially the environment team at BT. There's over 100,000 people who work for BT. So one of the important parts is how our HR colleagues can help us embed sustainability thinking into training, into induction programs, so people start to understand what sustainability means to, to, to BT. And, and yeah, absolutely, I would echo that point um, Gabriel made about the importance of, of having, being a sustainable business and attracting the right talent. You know, pe people will not join companies if they are not uh, up in their game in sustainability. So, it, you know, that's massive problem. And that's not even taking account of, of the investor community as well, which has got huge demands as well. So, you know, it, there is not one stakeholder group, I don't think, who, who don't realize that um, climate change is important. And yeah, our, our own colleagues and employees be, being a critical stakeholder in that. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because so much of the conversation is about the opportunities from you know, sustainability about creating green jobs as though these are new jobs that are going to be magically created from everyone shifting out of existing jobs into new technologies and new activities when actually so much of it is about changing what existing jobs are already doing and the opportunities that come from that and actually greening the day-to-day the -day jobs that, that we all have. But, you know, if I maybe to pick you up, you mentioned a question there about finance. I mean, more broadly, are you beginning to see a, a, a significant shift amongst the investor community around companies' approach to sustainability. We've heard a lot about companies being much more open about the sustainability plans, but is that something which you're you're seeing much more as as a visible reaction within the investor community? Yes, completely. Um, I mean, you, you'll see the shifts in the talks of lots of different pension funds. You know, looking to you know create their own net zero transitions and to ensure that all their investments are reflecting uh, science-based targets. And, and this is again, absolutely um, mirrored by, by the broader investor community as well. Um, generally around once a year, we'll, we'll run a actual uh, session with the investor community where we just purely talk about uh, BT sustainability activities. And again, whereas in the past, you know, going back a sort of three, four years, we might have maybe had 10, 15 people. I, th I think now we're looking at having, you know, over sort of 40, 50 different investors joining those types of events. Lots of Q and A's getting into the detail. Um, and, and for example, that there's lots of standard things like a lot of big businesses like ourselves are signed up to the science-based uh, targets initiatives. We report <coughs> um, CDP results, et cetera, and we are all ranked and graded there. Um, but but yeah, that the investor community are wanting to dig behind you know, those ratings indices as well, and to actually find out what we're doing. So again, given examples like with the green tech innovation platform work, you know they're interested to see well what are we doing that's new, what are we looking to do that that's driving change in the market as well as change in the business, and and you know I we can only see that becoming more and more prevalent in in the coming years as again you know the need to. Uh, transition to a, a low carbon society it becomes more and more important and the markets have already recognized this and that that's you can see the money is is, is not you know it's very unwise to be putting money into anything that's fossil fuel based and, and that's the market will, will drive those changes great and i'm conscious of time um so if i can maybe ask you one slightly unfair question at the end both of you um if you could if you could have one hope for cop 26. So if we get to the end of the next two weeks and um, we can leave with one thing, what would it be? So maybe come to you. I'll come to you first, Ian, uh, and give you time, Gabrielle, to think, given that you were the first up to talk. So I'll come to you in first name, you, Gabrielle, if that's okay. So your one hope, your one hope. Um, yeah, I suppose, Praki, to boil it down to one thing is going to be difficult, but, but I think what I would really want to see is is that there is a massive shift to uh, across a number of countries where we are looking to align a lot closer to the 1.5 paris accord in terms of that that trajectory um currently we, we are way off that trajectory and um whilst it's obviously great that you know even um uh, you know saudi arabia announcing they're going to be net zero by 2060 you know Lots of people saying the right things about that kind of those future visions, but but I think there's one re you know, there's a reason why we call this a decade of action, uh, the next decade, because it is so important that that we do look to uh, limit global warming in the next decade, not not by 2040, by 2050, because by then some of the impacts are going to be too great. So yeah, I, 
if we can have one wish is, is that the world is essentially a lot closer to achieving that 1.5 degree um, trajectory. And I suppose that's the one wish. And if we could get that, that would be amazing. So <laughs> crossing fingers, touching wood. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's kind of what I'd say. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with, with Ian. I think that's the number one thing that, that we are uh, looking for and, and, you know, what are the commitments going to be from India, for example, or, you know, what are China's real plans going to be? But so to say something different from, from Ian, then he stole the number one answer. Um, I, I was just going to say, you know, one, one of the things that we need to look for is, I think, is scale. So involvement, uh, you know, so let's say, you know, we have a thousand companies with, with science-based targets, but, you know, we need tens of thousands, you know, uh, we need hundreds of thousands. We need all these small businesses and, and you know, they're just not enough of us. Um, and I think it's, it's easy to fall into the perception that because of the people that we talk to, the businesses that I'm sure, you know, you have, have invited to these sessions, you know, it all's like, yeah, we're all doing it, but actually so many more businesses are not. No, that's a, that's a really fair point. Um, and I guess that's the hope after things like COP, if it can bring up the agenda and get people to think about these things much more than even the fact that we're having these conversations as a success and as, a, as, a, as something which hopefully boosts progress. And well, I'm conscious of time and um, it's just left me to thank everyone for, for joining us. You'll be able to watch a recording of this webinar on our, on our College COP26 webpage and also on the, the Business School webpage too. Um, can I thank colleagues in Adam Smith Business School for helping us organise today's event. And finally, of course, thanks to Ian and Gabrielle for their great insights and reflections on BT's sustainability journey. And that's it from us and look forward to seeing you all soon. Our next Business of Sustainability webinars on Thursday with ING talking about financing of, of sustainability. So look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.